everyone and welcome to the first of our videos on the periodic table. There'll be a few for these. I've added in a few extra slides and updated the slides that you have access to online uh, just to give us a bit of background because I felt some of you may have been a little uncertain on the history and structure of the periodic table. So I'll go through that first and then uh, the other aspects of 3.1 and 3.2 that you need to know. I haven't outlined the assessment statements both blow by blow on here but they are all uploaded into the assessments uh, statements tab on your OneNote. So let's get started. So the modern periodic table as we know it was largely uh, put together by Dmitry Mendeleev, this lovely crazy looking guy over here. Um, okay and most of you know that he proposed the periodic law, even if you don't know that that's what it call, is called. This idea that the properties of the elements are periodic functions of their relative atomic masses. That being that they repeat uh, over and over again um, in a regular pattern according, that is relative to their atomic masses. So what he did was arrange the elements according to an increase of their relative atomic mass and the periodicity of their properties, so these repeating properties that he was observing from these elements. He left gaps for elements which he predicted had not yet been discovered, okay, and there was a few. So in Mendeleev's time, there was 63 elements that were known, and he basically grouped them according to their chemical nature or properties. It is important to note here that in Mendeleev's time, the electron was not known to exist. Neither were even protons and neutrons. So he was doing a lot of things that gave rise to us being able to explain by using atomic structure, even though he was unaware of the nature of subatomic particles at the time. So this picture here is actually a picture from Russia, which shows Mendeleev's periodic table. You will notice that there is no noble gases, okay? Because just like they didn't know about uh, protons, electrons, or neutrons in Mendeleev's time, uh, because the noble gases were so unreactive, they also hadn't been discovered at this point in time. But it does have the common pattern that we understand, which has elements and vertical columns called groups. And these are groups such that they have similar physical and chemical properties in a group. And then elements in the horizontal rows, which we refer to as periods, are arranged in increasing atomic mass from left to right. So as we move from left to right, uh, we get increasing atomic mass. Um, this contrasts to the modern periodic table, which we use atomic number. Now that we know about the presence of protons, this has changed to be atomic number. And what this means is that there are a couple of distant differences in the modern periodic table compared to Mendeleev's due to the presence of isotopes making some um, atomic masses heavier than what the atomic number would position those elements in the table. So following Mendeleev, there were a couple of revisions. Uh, John Rayleigh and William Ramsey discovered the noble gases. Mosley in 1913, um, following the discovery of protons, changed it from the atomic mass to the to the atomic number, which is what we now use. Okay, so this is the modern way that they are arranged, no longer through atomic mass. And then once uh, we hit the nuclear revolution in the 1930s and 40s with Einstein and Seaborg and Rutherford and everything, uh, we ended up having um, the discovery of the neutron. We also have um, the actinides and lanthanides, which came in after that as well. So I guess the question is a lot of people wonder why, why is there all the fuss about the periodic table? And really, it's simply because it takes a huge amount of information, okay, in one compact space, minimizes the, the need for you guys to memorize every single element or facts of all about the animal elements. You have a huge amount of information on one A4 page, okay? In fact, the lanthanides and actinides sit, those group F elements sit down the bottom, 
purely because it makes it easier for it to be printed on a page. Okay, if they were pulled out, uh, left into the periodic table, it'd be really, really long and wouldn't fit on a page. So it's been designed largely and has gone through a number of different designs. The one we use in class is not the only design for a periodic table um, to, as a way to organize knowledge and allow scientists to extrapolate known facts and predict based on this. So for the periods, we have periods one through seven. The number of the period equates to the outermost shell of the atom that we are talking about. The groups, as we said before, are the vertical columns. They contain elements that all have the same outer shell configuration and are labeled using normal numbering from one to 18, remembering that we don't use Roman numerals now for that anymore. The group numbers are equivalent to the number of outer shell electrons, only the digit for groups 13 to 18. So in group 1 and group 2, they have two outer shell electrons. We skip over the transition metals, then three outer shell electrons, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, across the way, uh, eight being our noble gases. So essentially when we as we move on from our understanding of the periodic table from year 10, we start to learn that a large number of the properties that we see in elements are periodic. This includes melting point, conductivity, reactivity, the way they react to form compounds. All of these depend on the electron configuration. So they under show or exhibit the same kind of periodic trends as what we see in the periodic table. So the regular pattern of similar electronic configurations observed as the atomic number increases gives rise to the observed periodicity. Okay, and that idea that shells uh, build their way up to full going from one through to eight in the valence shell means that every eight we start that trend over again and we continue it until the next eight. So these are the blocks that you're expected to know. Um, group one and two form S block, and this is because electrons go into S subshells when we do our electron configurations. D block are our transition metals. P block is where we tend to find our nonmetals and metalloids. And then our metals over here and of course, as we go down the steps down here. Okay, F block is where we find our actinoids and lanthanides. You should certainly be aware of group 17 having the special name of the halogens. Group 18 is our noble gases and group one and two having the names alkali or alkaline metals and alkaline earth metals is very important as well as we will look at these groups a lot. So down the group, elements in the periodic table have similar properties. This is mostly true and certainly true for group 1 and group 2, group 17 and group 18. However, we do see some variation within here. And if you think about that, there are non-metals at the top of these groups and then metals towards the bottom or metalloids. So in these groups where we have combinations of non-metals and metals, we see different properties because we see different types of bonding within those substances. Across the period, as we move from left to right, that we observe a significant difference in properties, but they do follow patterns. Okay, and the main reason that we have changes in terms of effective nuclear charge. So I'm going to leave that here in terms of our structure of the periodic table. The next video will be on effective nuclear charge, how we calculate it and how we define it.